Good uh, afternoon to you all. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to this event, uh, which is organized by the European Chair for Sustainable Development and Climate Transition. It's the chair that is uh, supported by the European Investment Bank, HSBC, and Hermes, um, and, uh, of which uh, Mark is the chairholder. And I want to thank you, Mark, for putting together this great panel that is going to look at the just part of the climate transition. We know that um, fairness will be a very important ingredient to make sure the climate transition works. It works at the level of countries. It works at the level of businesses, companies. It works at the level of individuals. So at all these levels, we need to make sure that the collective task of reducing carbon emissions um, is not only felt as fair, but it is in reality fair. So what uh, the panel will do today is unpack how we can achieve this objective of reducing carbon emissions while also taking care and managing the negative impact that this endeavor can have, will have, uh, for uh, uh, countries, as I said, uh, for communities and uh, for workers. Of course, if we look at countries, fairness is very important to make sure that the burden of the reduction is not on countries, uh, is more on countries that bear the burden of the historic em emissions they have been responsible for, and that there is a fairness in the distribution of the efforts that each one of those countries will do. Uh, just after this session, I'm going to jump on a plane to go to Indonesia, uh, where this issue of uh, climate, um, um, climate revolution, the reduction of emissions, is not just only a good thing to have, is a necessity for a country that is already on the front line uh, of the impact of climate transition, but they want to make sure that the efforts they will undertake are fair compared to the efforts that they feel traditional historical emitters uh, will have uh, to take. Fairness also um, on uh, communities, communities uh, that are most affected, those that are in the agricultural sector, those communities that live closer to the sea or depend on the sea, uh, or depend on resources that are becoming a scarcer as a result uh, of uh, climate change. And finally, fairness also for workers. Uh, we keep talking about uh, the many jobs that the Green Revolution can create, but for those who are losing their jobs, it has to be more palatable that thinking about the great uh, jobs that may be out there uh, in the horizon. So in order to unpack the, this impact uh, that climate change can have on all these different uh, groups, um, and in order not only to look at the who, but also to look at the how, what financing mechanisms, what support uh, initiatives, uh, what uh, skilling uh, policies, or how do we anticipate uh, those challenges. We have a stellar panel um, with um, Feb Kunduri, who's the, uh, on, uh, online. Thank you, Feb, for being with us. UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, we have Sana Markkanen. Thank you uh, for being with us. Cambridge Institute for Sustainable uh, Leadership. Sarah, Sarah Muse. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next, Economy uh, Laboratory, and last but not least, uh, Frank Seaburn Thomas from the European Commission. Um, under the very able leadership of uh, Mark Ringel, they will unpack all these different dimensions for you. So, good luck, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Arancha, and well, very warm welcome also from my side. Perspectives on just transition, um, I suppose, for, well, Chair for Sustainable and, and climate transition, the subject seems a little bit off. You know, shouldn't, shouldn't we speaking about, well, carbon reduction, shouldn't we speak about adaptation? But then, at a closer side, actually, I mean, that's just actually the mandate which is emerging from, from the last COP. Pretty much, I mean, what every speaker actually endorsed and was pushing for was, we need to do more and we need to go further, speeding up. But speeding up the transition actually translates into, you know, 
making climate change work, yes, but also making the transition much quicker, much less adaptable than if we had more time for that. So there's an issue of actually looking into that just transition, and that's actually what we want to do today as a sort of kickoff for further in-depth investigations on that topic. And I'm very happy that actually for that I've got speakers um, who are actually from the machine room, if I may call it, for, for making just transition work. Um, so quickly presenting in the order of speaker, first of all, Frank Sieber Thomas from the European Commission, head of the unit for fair, green and digital transitions and research. Wonderful package, I think, in terms of, in terms of work. I'm slightly jealous. Um, in charge of policy development analysis, um, but also research implementation. Then, um, stuck with a snowstorm, but happily online with us, Fabio Condori, Professor Fabio Condori, environmental economist at the Athens University of Economics, Technical University of Denmark, looking into sustainability interactions between nature, society, and the economy. It's quite hard to actually, I mean, single out a few of the many activities that Phoebe is doing, but just, I mean, mentioning that she's president of the European Scientific Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, and also chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network Global Hub, co-chair of SDSN Europe and Greece. Then, um, Sana Markinen, Dr. Sana Markinen from the University of Cambridge, research program lead, senior analyst um, at the Center for Policy and Industrial Transformation, looking very much into the well individual effects of just transition, um, which is the backbone of your, your, your works, looking very much also in the implementation of the Fit for 55, so we've got two Fit for 55 experts. And well, finally, rounding off the panel, Sarah Mavis um, from Next Economy Lab, who's political economist, mediator, and who, with a couple of colleagues, has actually done a study on looking into the just transition for the European car industry. Actually, one of these industries which will be most impacted by the transitions moving on at sectoral level. So we've got a nice package from moving from Europe to international to individual. Um, to the sectorial perspective. Let's see how that is going. But I should stop talking and, and get the people who are really interesting in place. So without further ado, Frank, the floor is yours for the European perspective. Yes, well, thank you very much, <coughs> Mark. Thank you very much for the introduction invitation. I'm very happy to be here with you. And, <coughs> and to present, I shed some lights on the EU's perspective on the approach to um, uh, on just transition from both a policy angle and a research angle. <laughs> Uh, as was said, we are a relatively new unit set up in, direct, in the Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Integration. It comes, nat comes natural to us to, to deal with issues of social fairness. What's new is probably that we are more and more involved in the work also or in the social fairness aspects um, of climate energy policies and vice versa. And I'll try to say a word about this. It was also our unit that um, organized together with the International Labour Organization the first um, just transition pavilion ever at COP last year in Sharm El Sheikh, something we want to do also to promote <coughs> just transition at the international level. And the, the following speakers will say more about this. And um, I'm glad to be here also because, <coughs> let's say, I believe Europe is undertaking a lot of efforts to ensure that this twin transition, as we call it, green and digital transitions, are taking place in a fair way. And this in the context of unprecedented challenges, or as <coughs> it's now coined in the context of a perma crisis, we are hardly out of the COVID pandemic. If we are out of it, uh, we are facing an energy and cost of living crisis, and at the same time, a war in Europe, which has a lot of bearings um, on the topics we are discussing. Um, so I, in the, uh, it's a challenging task to get you through this, but I will try to do my best. So after a short introduction of the political context, I would like to focus on three areas. First, the perceptions of Europeans on the fairness of the green transition. Second, a short summary of the main evidence in the area of employment, skills, social policy impacts, distribution impacts. And third, a snapshot on the policy measures we are putting in place to address this. And um, um, obviously, all of those slides, they will be shared, and you, you, can, you can have them, and we are, we are at your disposal if you have further questions or want references um, from these slides. So let me start with the policy context in, in, uh, in one slide. In 2019, when this commission started its mandate, uh, it adopted the European Green Deal, um, and, uh, to which uh, led to an increased climate and energy ambition. 
in particular to become the first climate neutral continent um, in, the, in the world by 2050 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030. Uh, a lot of work has been done since to put this in place, to also adjust the legislation at European level and in the member states to those new targets. This package is called the Fit for 55 package in view of the 55% reduction. And obviously, more recently, a lot of measures have been taken <coughs> to address the new challenges which come with the energy crisis and the, the war, um, uh, called in particular Repower EU package following a summit in Versailles and the French presidency last year, which is a package um, to, uh, on top of the ambition which was already in the table, to ensure energy security, diversify energy sources, and speed up the transition. And obviously all of this leads to putting just transition even more in the center stage, um, because we have to make sure that nobody is left behind um, in this transition, and uh, that uh, solidarity mechanisms are being put in place. When she launched the European Green Deal, President von der Leyen um, highlighted that this package aims to combine the reduction of emissions with measures to preserve <coughs> nature and to put jobs and social balance at the heart of the transformation. So this um, double, uh, this link between the environmental climate dimension and the social dimension has always been part of it. And it's our job in the back room to make sure or to try to, in, to make sure that it's um, in the legislations and that it, um, this transition is, not a, is felt to be fair and is fair actually by some standards. When um, the executive vice president, Franz Timmermans, who is the, that's the Dutch commissioner, defended the increased climate ambition in parliament, he coined this phrase that transition has to be just or there will just be no transition. And that's, I think, the main narrative um, we are defending at European level. Um, the, tr the transition is a challenging task and we will not be able uh, to achieve it um, if we do not uh, empower people, if we do not support people, companies, um, consumers um, to make this happen. Let me start with a snapshot on the perceptions on the green transition. At European level, we conduct representative surveys called Eurobarometer. We conducted the Eurobarometer last year on the fairness perceptions of the green transition, um, <coughs> um, which was published. The data are also accessible for researchers if that's of interest to you. Um, so to, to show to you a brief uh, summary of the main um, results, when it comes to expectations and concerns, and you always have in these charts, which probably are a bit difficult to read, in the outer circle, uh, the EU average, and in the inner circle, the French result. Um, so the blue bars are generally uh, agreeing with the statement we asked about, and the red ones, the red parts of the pie, uh, rejection. So first, um, the first question was, whether people agree that the transition should not leave anyone behind. On the left side, you see eight out of, on, out of uh, 10 Europeans and even more, nine out of 10 French do agree with the statement. When being asked if they are confident that this uh, target can be reached, the target of having sustainable goods, services in place and affordable to all by 2050, the picture looks a bit different. So there you do have increasing skepticism um, some 48% uh, of Europeans would disagree with that, but close to two thirds of French who are not confident that this target can be achieved. Um, this skepticism also translated a bit in a re response um, on the, um, to what extent the different levels of governance do address um, this problem sufficiently. So you do have uh, probably lower ratings uh, in, Fra in France but with a similar pattern that, uh, if anything, um, the, uh, the degree of satisfaction with climate change action is highest at the local and regional level and uh, res um, comparatively lower at the national level and for um, companies um, in particular. When asked about opportunities, on the other hand, there's more optimism. So uh, majorities in the EU, but also in France, agree that uh, overall this green transition will create more jobs and good quality jobs than it will destroy. Um, similarly, when being asked um, if it is important for respondents to be in a job themselves that uh, helps to advance the green transition, uh, a huge majority um, says, so as you can see here, so. 57% uh, of French say it's important to them, and the 
um, very much uh, in line with the EU average and the age pattern, educational patterns of those responses is the same. Um, unsurprisingly, it's uh, highest in the younger age cohorts, in particular among people still studying, two-thirds state that's important for them to contribute, so maybe some of you are part of those and uh, uh, have the same ambitions. Less, uh, there are more concerns again then if people are asked, do you have the right skills in place? Um, to contribute to the green transition. So here you can see a snapshot with um, all member states. France is um, to the right with um, uh, more than 40% of French uh, stating that they're not confident that they have the skill sets needed to contribute to the green transition. And this also includes, obviously, this highlights the need for reskilling, upskilling, including vocation and vocational education training and many technical jobs which will be needed. Um, this year has been declared at European level the European Year of Skills, which means there are a lot of activities in 23, 24, and a lot of initiatives trying to accelerate exactly these uh, the actions on reskilling and upskilling. And the last uh, two, two last slides to, to conclude on the Eurobarometer, when being asked uh, about their own responsibilities, it's a clear sign that Europeans see a shared responsibility to contribute to green transition. Four out of five French see it as a personal responsibility to act to limit climate change, but at the same time, and that's on the right side, uh, two out of five think they cannot do anything to reduce their energy consumption. So here again, you have uh, some kind of trade-offs or conflicting evidence, which shows that it's important that policy supports and empowers consumers and citizens to contribute to the green tradition as they wish to. And last but not least, um, we have asked for a number of what could be such policy options or support policies um, to, to foster the green transition. And there's generally support to all of those categories, which includes um, investments in public transport and alternative forms of uh, mobility in particular, but also support to vulnerable households who cannot afford uh, higher energy prices. Um, also measures to encourage private companies to step up their efforts, including reskilling, upskilling of staff, um, um, retraining, as I said already, and last but not least, to our own surprise, the last bar you see uh, with a share of 60% of respondents uh, agreeing to it, um, so a majority even would agree with a measure to allocate a quota of energy to each citizen for further use, which is something currently not in the political pipeline, but something interesting for discussion probably. A word on the main challenges and opportunities, a summary of the evidence we have. In one slide, what we think, the green transition overall has the potential for what we call a triple dividend. It not only can it reduce emissions, but it can also create uh, better and uh, jobs and quality jobs, new jobs, in particular in sectors such as renewable energy production, circular economy and construction and many others uh, at the same time. And third, we can improve the well-being of everyone with the right accompanying policies in place. If we put po policies in place to compensate people and support people with their investments. At the same time, we know that this transition will have unequal effects. It has unequal effects across sectors and across regions. So it will entail job losses in certain sectors or regions, fossil fuel based industries in particular, job gains and others, those I've mentioned. It will lead to a lot of labor reallocation and restructuring. Uh, Sarah will probably speak about this in energy intensive industries, automotive value chains and others. And uh, it requires a lot of changing skill needs for the new jobs in the green economy that we may not yet know. So there's uh, substantial job creation potential here. For example, an example we have seen, the jobs in renewable energy production over the last 20 years have increased by more than 90%. At the same time, we see that there is increasing signs of skill shortages, um, labor and skill shortages in these sectors. And uh, we think uh, policy action is needed to avoid that this becomes an, a real obstacle to the green transition slowing down our ambition. And all of this, that's the third bullet, I probably would like to highlight this, takes place at the moment where coming out of the COVID pandemic, labor markets have shown great resilience. The programs put in place to promote short-time work and to support employment have worked. The employment levels are at record level again in Europe and unemployment is relatively low in historic perspective, yet there's a big moment of uncertainty now for various reasons you know, um, but this uncertainty we have to address in our policies. Um, what do we do in our analysis? I have a lot of 
chats I could share. I'm happy to share the um, details with you. Uh, one thing, one indicator we look at is energy poverty, the risk that households cannot afford to pay their energy bills or cannot afford to heat or cool their homes up, up adequately. Before the COVID crisis, at least 35 million Europeans were affected by energy poverty and the uh, risks that this share will rise. And the, the chart here shows you the dark blue bars, the shares of the population in that group in energy poverty of low income households, poor income households below 20% um, um, the lowest two income deciles. And the light blue bars are the middle income households. So you also see that energy poverty is not only a phenomenon of households in, in income poverty, but more generally also of households with middle incomes. Another issue we are looking at more uh, importantly, and this was mentioned in the introduction, is the issue of climate inequalities. That's a matter both at international levels, discussed later, but also within our economies and societies. And the, the figures here of the chart, which I've taken from the um, report just published by the World Inequality Lab, uh, Lucas Chancel and his colleagues, um, the Climate Inequality Report shows how across the different income groups, the bottom 50% on the left, the middle 40% and the top 10% on the right, you have differences in, in the exposure to climate change, the red bars, um, in the emissions, the green bars, and in the capacity to act if you want, the wealth or capacity to finance, the blue bars. So those who contribute least to emissions, the lowest bottom 50% who account for 12% of overall emissions, uh, uh, let's say uh, bear 75% of all the risks related to it, um, and the top 10% the opposite. So this leads to questions to be addressed in policy making which are difficult. In the last section I would come to the policy part and just recall this is a presentation of the European Green Deal that this is a massive transformative agenda. It was called new Europe's new um, growth uh, strategy when presented, but it's a massive transformative agenda which cuts across a lot, many, many fields, um, energy, mobility, food, agriculture, uh, many areas. And the two blue um, parts here, financing transition on the left and uh, just transition on the right, are cross-cutting uh, priorities of relevance for all parts of this package <coughs> and have to be dealt with to ensure that the financing of the transition is ensured and that the transition is happening in a fair way, as was said before. I have two charts here which I will not explain, overviews of what the Fit for 55 package is, which was adopted in July 21 and December 21. It's a package of more than 20 legislative initiatives which the Commission has put on the table to adjust the economy and move forward towards the 55% package. Um, the, all of these initiatives have been, let's say, in negotiation or are still in negotiation, some of them. Many have been concluded and I would like to highlight one, which is this one here called Council Recommendation on a Fair Transition. It's something on which we have been working, um, which is um, an initiative which was proposed in December 21. It was negotiated in the first half of 22 under French presidency of the Council and concluded, adopted in June 22. And it was uh, something which was announced um, in the Fit for 55 package in recognition of the, uh, the important employment skills, social impacts climate and energy policy have at European level. You have a couple of funds in place, financing instruments, I will show them in a, in a minute, which can help address certain issues, um, regions uh, affected by the phasing out of coal industries, for example, the Just Transition Fund, or households or companies affected by a new emissions trading scheme on buildings and road transports. Um, the so-called social climate fund, but there are many, many effects um, to be expected here which are, cannot be addressed by these um, um, funds and which have to be addressed at national level and at regional level. Therefore, the request for us to propose such a recommendation, uh, a council recommendation is a legally non-binding instrument providing guidance to member states or with which member states commit to do certain actions. So through this council recommendation, member states have committed uh, to put in place comprehensive policy packages and just transition policies just to support um, the transition. Um, this is based obviously also on the ILO guidelines for just transition and other tools which are out there. On this slide, again, I will not have time to go into much detail, but happy to take questions and discuss. I, I show the structure of this council recommendation. 
important to note that these comprehensive policy packages um, go beyond retraining or reskilling, for example. So they cover active support to, of transitions into high quality jobs <coughs> in green sectors of the economy, but also in other sectors, be it uh, education, be it the health sector, health economy and others, care, um, all of um, important transitions um, as part of a sustainable economy have to be covered. Education, training and skills, obviously, but also social protection to s provide income support, support for people during their transitions. And last but not least, strengthen access to essential services, including energy, <coughs> mobility and uh, digital communications. The recommendation also says all actors have to be involved of society, social partners who can uh, negotiate this at company and sectoral level, and the civil society at large who has to be part of this transition and be involved. Um, and we have to make good use of all our funding tools. Um, the Social Climate Fund, one word, um, Fit for 55 introduces new emission trading and carbon price for buildings and road transport. Um, these are the two sectors which account for the majority of emissions where there has been little progress in the past, in particular in transport, but they're also the two sectors which uh, hit most um, the purse, the expenditures of households, obviously, which do you feel it because you have to pay your rent and you have to pay transport. And this was recognized in setting up this proposal and the Social Climate Fund will be put up using parts of the revenues of this new social um, emission trading to pay back to vulnerable households, enterprises, and transport users. In total, some 65 billion euros um, so, um, topped up by member states. And it will provide, for example, direct income support to households and SMEs. It will support investments in energy efficiency and renewables. Um, and it will address transport poverty. Member states uh, have to report on this and have to show how these measures lead to reducing the number of people in transport poverty in their member states and important probably also as outcome of the negotiations between the European Parliament and the Council, so the group of member states, it was decided that this fund will be front loaded, it will start at least one year before the emissions trading kicks in to also show that we take uh, this into account um, and uh, ensure that uh, people um, can afford energy costs. There were a lot of sectoral initiatives. I will not have go into it a lot. Something uh, called the renovation wave, whereby Europe sets a target to renovate house stock, the housing stock, better insulate housing, and create new jobs in this context. And there's funding support. I want to end on the tools we have here. In particular, the cohesion funds, the, Europe, the European Social Fund, the European Regional Development Fund, the uh, Just Transition Fund, which all support retraining, upskilling initiatives and other initiatives to um, um, promote social inclusion and active labor market policies, job creation. You have the so-called Recovery and Resilience Facility, a uh, historic um, facility set up in the COVID crisis, uh, whereby the European Commission has taken uh, debt to subsidize member states and give loans to member states to address the impacts of the crisis. Uh, for this, member states have to draft national reform plans, which are being agreed with the Commission, and they get the money upon delivery when showing that they have reached certain milestones and objectives. Um, and what has been done to integrate the transition dimension is that member states have to ensure that a certain amount of this money goes into climate-related uh, expenditure, 40% at least, or in the digital transition, 20%. Um, in the European Social Fund, there's a concrete target to contribute to the greener, <coughs> low-carbon Europe through education, training, skills and qualification, creation of new jobs. Um, France has an allocation of 6.7 billion euros and two national programs using the European Social Fund to promote such initiatives. In the Just Transition Fund, I said regions are supported, some 20 billion euros in total to uh, diversify regional economies and invest in business creation. Um, France has here also six regional programs in the areas you see here, in particular Nord-Pas-de-Calais and bouches du rhone um, to promote energy and climate transition and competitiveness, also with a view to creating jobs. And the Recovery and Resilience Plan of France, I said, accounts for f almost 40 billion euros, out of which more than half goes into green transition-related expenditure 
uh, but also an important share, 40%, into <laughs> social expenditure. Last but not least, last week the Commission has presented a new Green Deal industrial plan to also improve the competitiveness of clean tech industries in particular, speed up permittal procedures, and uh, make, uh, uh, improve the funding um, of these industries. That's in part also a reaction to the US um, inf so-called Inflation Reduction Act, the new climate law. You have um, seen many, uh, the French presidents and many politicians went to the US also to talk to Mr. President Biden about this directly. It's a plan which gives a lot of subsidies to companies, including European companies, investing in green value chains in the US. So this is a European answer to it. And I will, uh, sorry for rushing through this, finish with one slide saying we also mainstream these just transition aspects, obviously, in a number of areas, um, including in energy policy, where member states have to, by the mid this year, come up with the updated national energy and climate plans. That's 10-year plans, investment plans for the energy transition. Um, in these plans, member states have to address just transition aspects more than the past, more than five years ago when they drafted their first plans, because it's understood, also as outcome of the energy crisis through which we are going, that we cannot discuss energy policy and investment without discussing skill availability, for example, or social issues. Um, under the Research and Innovation Program Horizon Europe, there are also a number of actions, finance, research actions, which are addressed to academics, obviously, and their so-called missions, including one mission on uh, smart and climate neutral cities, which wants to make um, up to 100 cities climate neutral by 2030. And I have to look into my notes to know which cities have been chosen for France. So for France, it's Angers, Loire Metropole, Bordeaux, Dijon, Dunkerque, Grenoble, Lyon, Marseille, Nantes, and Paris itself, who are part of this, so who are uh, part of this program, and hopefully thanks to the program will become climate neutral by 2030 and serve as lighthouses. And last but not least, I mentioned the international dimension where we work among others with the ILO. At COP last year, it was decided that COP will set up a just transition work program, a work stream, maybe ministerial meetings in the future, so that also at international level we promote this because justice and fairness has to cross, uh, cut across all dimensions, including the international one. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any comments or questions you have. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> so moving on without further ado, I mean, as, as we've been hearing, I mean, Europe has a lot around in terms of funding, in terms of structures. But Europe, as my PCA colleagues remind me, is only one part of the world. And uh, certainly at international level, I mean, the story is yet at another scale. And I'm very happy to have with us Ferbu Kondori um, to speak about the international level. So, Ferbu, the floor is yours. For the time being, we can't hear you. Okay, now you can hear me, I hope, right? Now we can hear you, <laughs> loud and clear, perfect. Thank you very much. Very good. So I, I have to just say that the internet connection is not stable. I am trapped in this crazy snowstorm at the outskirts of Athens. I, I don't love the city, so I live up in the mountains of the outskirts, and it's gorgeous up here, but at the moment, we are totally immobilized. So thank you for having me, even um, uh, virtually, and I will just start saying that uh, if you can measure, you can manage, and you can improve. So these uh, transitions, uh, transition towards the green and digital future, towards UN Agenda 2030, towards the implementation of the European Green Deal in Europe, it's really a big challenge. It's our hope, however, for the future. It's our hope to face the COVID, the um, uh, economic recession that resulted from the COVID and the disruption of uh, supply chains, now coupled with inflationary pressures, 
combined with the climate crisis and the biodiversity collapse crisis, and now with the geopolitical tensions, um, uh, which are multiple around the world, but we in Europe feel very strongly the war in Ukraine. And all this connected with the increasing energy crisis and food crisis and taking a global uh, picture, the, infla uh, the increasing population that we don't know how to feed and give decent uh, work and uh, living and the overall crisis of increasing inequality within states, but also between the developed world and the global south. So I'm saying that our future uh, is based on this challenge of uh, dealing with this crisis and uh, this multiple crisis. This is what we work on as Alliance of Excellence for Research and Innovation on Nightforia. Uh, which I founded and lead five different research centers, five different accelerators, and uh, uh, a, a vivid interface with uh, global networks for sustainability and uh, European and global academies of um, excellence. So uh, for me, the future, is in the implementation of the SDGs. And uh, within this uh, framework is where I see the hope in dealing with the multiple crisis. The SDGs is the way to measure in an exact and quantifiable way sustainable development progress, 17 goals, 169 targets, 232 KPIs, which we use to uh, quantify, to um, measure the performance of each and every country in the world against uh, the goal of sustainable development. And as uh, UN SDSN Network, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, we do this every year since 2015. The transposition of this uh, UN agenda and the Paris Agreement, of course, at the at European level has been very well presented, very eloquently presented by the previous speaker. The European Green Deal, four main axes, climate neutrality 2050, um, a reduction of pollution, uh, in order to safeguard the health of people and ecosystems, clean tech leadership for European uh, companies, and leave no one behind, social cohesion, which is what I'm going to try to focus on this presentation. The way we've reacted to the um, huge nonlinearity of COVID, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, the 750 billion in addition to the 1 trillion devoted to the European Green Deal showcases that Europe at least is very uh, consistent with regards to its growth strategy. Because even the non-linearity of COVID, the green and digital transition was not considered a luxury, but it was considered the way we should recover from COVID. 35% of any money uh, given two countries from the recovery and resilience facility should be climate mainstream, meaning um, renewables, circular economy, nature-based solutions, and immobility, and 20% of the money should be digital mainstream, meaning uh, deployment of cutting-edge technologies, cyber security, upskilling, and reskilling, in order to embrace digitalization. And all of this is also transposed in the uh, financial uh, system, the EU taxonomy that makes explicit that in order to get good loans, cheap loans, you need uh, to try, um, you need to be asking money for investments in climate mitigation, adaptation, circular economy, sustainable use of uh, water and marine uh, resources, biodiversity con uh, conservation. And at 
At the same time, the EU taxonomy imposes the Corporate Sustainability Directive for all companies that uh, are uh, big, that meaning 40 uh, million uh, turnover per year and more. And this means that the private sector it also needs to uh, restructure itself according uh, to uh, sustainability principles. And then the Fit for 55, which is a regulatory proposal, a number of regulatory proposals that basically refine the regulation of the energy system and the land use system so that it can become climate neutral by 2030 and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55 percent by 20 um, uh, uh, by 2030, sorry, and climate neutrality by 2050. And of course, after the war, Europe decided to say that we are going to focus on our renewable capacity and we are going to be independent from Russia fossil fuel. And this was documented in the Repower EU. So this is the the global uh, um, situation transposed into the European uh, Green Deal. The global situation with regards to climate, however, is not very good. Where you see green is where we have achievement of the SDG climate action. Where you see red is where we have major challenges and orange and green indicate challenges at two different degrees. This is what we are today, and this is how we will be in 2030 if we remain on the same pace of implementation. And the same is true for Europe. This is the European um, SDSN sustainable development report, you can see that the uh, North countries are more efficient. Remember, these are the countries that have more fiscal space and are the countries that have better connection between uh, science and policy making and are the countries that have the ability to invest in new technologies, upskill and reskill accordingly. And uh, this is uh, the picture of Europe as, um, as it stands uh, today. You see we are facing major challenges with regards to climate, water and land use. These are the significant ecosystem related SDGs. So it seems that Europe is doing well and it's uh, is, is doing um, pretty good in areas like uh, quality education and gender equality and decent work and economic growth, but it seems to be falling behind in its ability to manage its environment and ecosystem, which form the basis for the production and consumption activities. And another interesting uh, result within Europe is that uh, the, there is um, explicit difference between the achievement, the ability of achieving the SDGs between different areas of Europe. Northern and Western countries are definitely uh, leaders here, whereas Southern Europe, Central, Eastern Europe and candidate countries are falling behind. We, uh, been arguing since many years, but in 2019, during the United Nations General Assembly, we presented the six transformations that are uh, crucial for the implementation of the SDGs. And this is, uh, these six transformations uh, are fully implemented if all the SDGs are implemented, but have different loadings of SDGs in them. The first transformation refers to education, gender and inequality. The second, health, well-being and demography. And we consider these two as the social cohesion transformations. Then the third transformation is energy decarbonization and sustainable industry. Fourth, sustainable production of food, land, water and oceans. 
fifth, sustainable cities and communities, and uh, sixth, the digital revolution for sustainable development. In the senior working group on the European Green Deal uh, of SDSN that I lead with Professor Jeff, Jeff Sachs, um, we have done a, a tax uh, mining um, exercise in order to see the connection between the SDGs and the European Green Deal. And you can see that the European Green Deal is prioritizing climate action, industry innovation and infrastructure, affordable and clean energy. This is relevant to social cohesion, responsible consumption and production, and decent work and economic growth, which is again relevant to social cohesion. However, if you try to see the significance of each of this transformation as supported by the policy documents of the European Green Deal. And here we have all the policy documents, all the uh, nine policies of the European Green Deal, all the initiatives, the digital and industrial policy of Europe, Fit for 55, the Recovery and Resilience Plan, all these documents amounting to hundreds of thousands of pages transposing their aims in textual analysis into SDG um, relevance. And what we find in terms of the six transformations that I showed before is that the European Green Deal is very efficient with regards to transformation four and three, which are relevant to sustainable use of the uh, ecosystems and the environment and the energy decarbonization and sustainable industry, they are less strong with regards uh, the European Green Deal and European policies in general are less strong with regards to sustainable cities and communities and the digital revolution for sustainable development. And unfortunately, they are quite weak with regards to education, gender inequality, health, well-being and demography, which are the social cohesion transformations no big transformation can be achieved without social cohesion and without really engaging, empowering all the stakeholders to engage in the transition. And this transformation that we are asking our generation to achieve is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, across um, uh, human history. So we need to make sure that social cohesion in there is there empowering uh, the civil society, the labor market, the businesses, the policy makers, the, the financial institutions, all the stakeholders. And if we look at how we spend the recovery and resilient money in Europe, well, we can see that we spend it in a very SDG compatible way. But here again, the big spending is on goal 9, 13, 8, 7, and 11, which are goals uh, uh, which, uh, on average, Europe performs well. So if I had to optimize the spending, this would not have been the allocation. I show you results from the seven Southern European countries that basically get 50% of the total EU recovery grants. This is just the grants, not the loans. So again, we need to align better with what we need, where we need more help, and where we can achieve faster progress without additional uh, fiscal uh, space from the uh, governments. Uh, with regards uh, to uh, the crucial aspect of uh, this transformation, one of the crucial aspects of this transformation, at least as how I see this uh, uh, transformation, is that we need to uh, really uh, have a, um, a robust valuation, not just of produced capital, which is traded in financial in markets, but in also for human capital and natural capital. And we did a big meta analysis econometric exercise in order to value the ecosystems um, services of terrestrial marine and freshwater ecosystem against uh, in the 14 biogeographical and marine regions of Europe, and we find the much unwillingness to pay by ecosystem and country, 
an ecosystem service, and we also find a strong correlation between willingness to pay and countries. Um, the willingness to pay represents the willingness to pay of the citizens of the country, and we find a, a strong correlation between this willingness to pay and the achievement of the environmental related SDG, SDG 13 on climate, 14 on marine resources, and um, uh, 15 on land use, and SDG 6 on fresh water which tells you that uh, citizens that are aware of the value of ecosystem services for the production and consumption capabilities of an economy are the, uh, uh, belong to countries that perform well against the SDGs. So pricing externality explicitly and integrating these correct price signals into decision making and cost benefit analysis and investment is crucial. The other big issue, of course, is the distributional effects of, of uh, key uh, EU climate policies. And uh, of course, here we know that there are going to be regressive effects, and we need to mitigate those regressive effects for the vulnerable households. We have done uh, an analysis um, in a general equilibrium framework, and we show that with a package of measures that includes lump sum tra uh, transfers and lowering VAT and targeted energy efficiency measures and job retraining programs and funding of subsidies for new low carbon technologies via general taxation, you can achieve not only to mitigate the regressive effects of uh, climate policies, but you can also ensure more equality and increase employment in all regions of Europe. In the Lancet uh, uh, Commission for COVID-19 that I had the honor uh, to lead the Green Recovery Task Force uh, in order to move slowly away from Europe and uh, speak about the whole of the world, we identify the sectors that are crucial for the green recovery. So is the energy sector and the shift from fuel space to mineral space, energy production, storage and distribution. Agriculture and food sector needs to be directly linked to the environment and the ecosystem. The housing and urbanization uh, growth should be managed sustainably. The health sector should invest in recovery packages that strengthen health systems and increase regulation on risk sources and research and development will need to be devoted to geoengineering for removing CO2 emissions from the atmosphere. And overall, the recovery packages across the world um, need uh, to uh, a, a, a increase the financial resources devoted to um, uh, the green and digital transition. Uh, the post-COVID-19 uh, recovery uh, showed across the uh, world a largely insufficient funding for green uh, recovery, including most G20 countries. And uh, actually, this led us to uh, recommending this last commission report that G20 and G7 countries should take major steps for developing financing for development financing of a green, digital, and inclusive recovery for, from the pandemic and for achieving the SDGs. So we suggested increasing lending to the multilateral uh, development banks to provide low-income developing countries funding, increases support of UN member states for existing green funds, and enacting global tax reforms on mega wealth and carbon emissions for climate finance. One important point is that one-third of global assets under management are now ESG-based, and the recovery should build on this momentum. And the, uh, uh, another interesting thing with regards to uh, um, justice is uh, how uh, uh, our trade creates and tra externalities, which can be analyzed SDG-based, and how these externalities should be avoided, especially when they are created from the developed world to the developing world, to the global south. And we have a very detailed analysis per 
trade uh, per export between countries according to SDG achievement. Going back to the financing issue, no public money are enough to finance the SDGs transformation. The private sector should come in, and the private sector should come in with enough incentive to really engage, not in greenwashing, but in real infrastructural and um, education, upskilling, reskilling investments in order to support this transition. Not because they are uh, philanthropic, but because data shows that sound ESG performance implies good financial performance, lower systemic risk, improved profit margins, and better returns and returns on equity uh, ratios. That's why we came up with a, a system that allows companies, with a methodology that allows companies to assess their uh, processes, but also their production, but also asset portfolio companies. Uh, so you can come, you can uh, apply this to any uh, kind of uh, company. We try to come up with a methodology that the environmental, social, and governance. KPIs and measurements can be uh, transposed in, into SEG measurements. And why is this important? It is important because a company needs to understand that the transition to an ESG-based production and distribution is not one that will hinder its uh, profit potential. The company should be enabled to identify the transformations that allow them to become environmentally consistent, socially enhancing governance, uh, um, uh, to have governments that is socially acceptable, and at the same time increasing their profit through lowering costs. Now renewables are cheaper. Now circular economy provides huge potential for cost reduction, but also through increasing their clientele, given the increased demand for sustainable products. With regards to employment in clean energy, in our partnership for this report, we had the International Energy Agency, and the main results tell us that employment in clean energy sector is sensed to become an increasingly important part of labor markets with growth more than offsetting declining traditional fossil fuel. An additional 13 million of workers will be employed in clean energy, and what is again an issue is that advanced economies are nearing levels needed to shift trajectories towards net zero, but emerging and developing economies are only at 20% of the levels and face narrowing fiscal options, um, especially after the pandemic. To go fast, I uh, will close by saying that uh, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are really very uh, severe. Uh, it is estimated that by the end of the decade, we are going to go beyond the 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius increase compared increase in average temperature compared to pre-industrial levels. This cannot happen because we, have, we do not have the technology to protect ourselves against a world that will change that much. And this is why the UNSDSN has created a global climate hub, which I have the honor to chair. And um, the aim of this hub is to co-design with national and sub-national um, stakeholders uh, optimal, the optimal mixture, mixture of uh, technologies, policies, and financial instruments that can support at national level the transition to a climate neutral and a climate resilient world. The hub has nine units, a climate data platforms and digital application, atmospheric physics, climate and energy modeling, climate and land use modeling, climate and health modeling, innovation acceleration, which is crucial, 
Never before did we have such a pace of innovation and technological advancement, which is great, and it's our major hope for the achievement of the transition on time. However, the big question mark, at least for me, is whether the labor force has the capacity to embrace the uh, use of this new technology in such a limited amount of time. We need to seriously invest in upskilling and reskilling, not just in developed world, but also in the global south. And this will be the major uh, challenge of uh, our generation and beyond. And we also need to invest in continuous learning because technological problems progress will continue at this pace and even faster. The next unit is about the just transition and the labor market effects and how you finance this trans just transition. And the um, eighth unit is about co-designing in national living labs with all the relevant stakeholders, these uh, transition pathways, unless you co-design, unless the stakeholders own the solution pathways, you will never get implementation, at least on time. And finally, the last uh, part is on education, upskilling and reskilling. The last COP, the major achievement was the loss and damage fund, which is a historic recognition of the deepening inequity between polluters and sufferers of climate impacts between the developed world and the Global South, I hope we get our act together to make this fund um, functional and uh, to help the uh, countries that are becoming hotspots of climate effects without causing uh, these effects uh, to get out of this uh, very bad situation. And I will close by saying that during the last COP, and I've been attending the COPs for more than 20 years, non-state actors were those that had to show uh, the biggest strength and the biggest um, ability to mainstream resilience, increase finance for climate action, accelerate action, and build uh, credibility and trust. So, I feel that now that the technology is providing competitive, cost-competitive solutions, it is in the hands of all stakeholders, not just the politicians, to get this right. So let's try to empower people to engage fiercely in this and get it right. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. David. Well, that much about the comprehensive picture, but let's not forget that behind the comprehensive picture, there's the individual side of the story, um, and, and that's the individual. So without any further ado, moving over to Svenna Markinen to speak about energy poverty. Is the mic picking me up okay? Can you hear me? Yes, always. Okay, great. So, um, I'm going to talk about something slightly different because I'm going to talk about households and why they matter and it's not exactly obvious perhaps from the first few slides how and why this is a major climate related issue. So I'm going to talk about en energy poverty and I'm just going to skip through the first few slides very quickly uh, because some of it was covered by Frank. So um, I'm going to talk about what energy poverty is, why it matters, what we have been doing so far to address it. Um, and why many of these attempts have failed, more or less. Okay, going in the wrong direction. Here we go. Um, okay, so the general direct, uh, definition for energy poverty really is that a household is unable to uh, meet their energy needs. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we have at the moment is that there is or hasn't been so far, a unified definition for energy poverty in place in Europe um, and even more so globally. But even within Europe, we're only just now getting to the place that uh, the European Commission and the European Parliament 
and the Council have been working together to come up with a unified shared definition of what it means to be living in energy poverty. And as you can see, um, and this is an extract from the Energy Efficiency Directive recast um, that has been negotiated over the past 18 months. Um, but one of the key issues here is that um, it is linked specifically to non-affordability um, and it applies to heat, hot water and cooling technologies. Um, so climate change is really impacting the way in which we perceive energy poverty as well and the way in which people suffer from it. Um, why is it a growing concern? Where um, you all know gas prices in the wholesale market have gone up by about fivefold in just the past year or so. Um, household costs have increased quite rapidly, but not as quickly and as massively as the um, wholesale gas prices. Um, and it, electricity prices have also <coughs> increased. Um, these um, EU um, averages um, here on the left actually hide a lot of national level variation because um, of the measures that different EU states um, have taken to address energy poverty in their territories. Um, it is also a growing concern because, as Frank mentioned, um, energy poverty used to be the low income household concern. It's no longer just associated with low income. Um, it is increasingly becoming a middle income household problem. Um, and therefore, the att att um, action that we need to take to address that challenge uh, is becoming a lot bigger than it used to be. Um, one of the issues here is that inflation is very high, driven largely but not exclusively by the rapidly increasing um, energy costs. However, um, the, the rate at which salaries are increasing is well behind the inflation level and very, very few uh, companies um, are actually able um, to increase salaries at the level, at the rate um, at which the inflation is going up, which means that real incomes are coming down. And as you can see here, the cost of energy is really going up very rapidly, um, and that is leading to increasing energy poverty. Um, so we don't exactly know um, how many households in Europe live in energy poverty. We also don't know exactly how many households live in inadequate housing conditions. Um, but we do know that there are certain factors that increase people's or households' risk of energy poverty, um, and these include low income, um, low energy efficiency of the properties they live in, um, and high energy prices, which is obviously one of the factors that is driving up energy poverty at the moment, but also inefficient um, heating and cooling systems or other appliances. And this is often a challenge, particularly for asset rich but income poor households, such as pensioners with large properties um, who actually don't have much money coming in, uh, but have large properties to maintain. And also for tenants who have limited ability to impact um, the, the living conditions that they have. So who is most at risk? Um, particularly when we're talking about energy poverty, uh, there are a few categories where the risk is higher than it is among average, average population. So old people who spend a lot of time at home and often have limited mobility. Also old people because a lot of them live in owner-occupied houses that are very large, way bigger than they actually need, often have ineff inefficient heating appliances, people may not be so accustomed to using um, technologies such as smart meters and so on. Um, and also it's often very difficult for these people to get out of the house. So many of them spend a lot of time at home, which obviously increases the energy demand. Same applies to a great extent to young children um, and ill and disabled people. So people who spend a lot of time at home um, who are less able to move around or have medical conditions that make it difficult to regulate a body temperature, which means that you need to regulate the environment in which you are in. Um, and last but not least, private renters. Really, the state of the energy efficiency in the private rented market varies massively between the countries, but generally the private rented um, housing sector is the one where um, energy efficiency 
is um, much lower than it is in other sectors. Um, so obviously energy poverty is a challenge for households, but it is also a challenge um, for economies and societies more generally. So um, it's not just the household suffers from energy poverty, but it has huge impacts on their health and well-being. Um, and you can pretty much look at these things as what is the um, impact at household level and what is the macroeconomic impact. So when we talk about health and well-being, obviously there are issues such as stress, um, mental, which leads to mental health problems, can lead to physical health problems, uh, uncomfortable indoor temperature, whether it's too hot or too cold, increases your risk of certain illnesses um, and other health conditions. It can impact on children's school performance, uh, which, in, which then impacts on their future earning ability. Um, so these really can be quite, quite um, long-term um, impacts. But at the national level, uh, it impacts the need for healthcare services. Um, and increases morbidity and mortality. If we look at economic impacts at the household level, it reduces households' ability to spend in other things, um, which obviously can affect anything from their nutrition um, to, um, to, to other well-being. Um, in, the, in, in England, we call it the heat or the eat dilemma, um, which is really reflecting that you need to consider what you prioritise. Can also result in increasing levels of debt, which then impact on your future abilities and the op opportunities that you can offer your children. Uh, but at the national level, we're looking at lost productivity, lost days at work, um, and um, social impacts in terms of loneliness and isolation, particularly if you rely for your social interactions, being able to invite people into your home. So there has been quite a lot of um, um, quite a lot of different attempts to address energy poverty. Um, this has been at the EU level as well as national and subnational level um, and include really various different types of measures, including um, bans on the sale of certain inefficient um, products. So probably the most widespread example would be the ban on sale of incandescent light bulbs or certain eco-directives that impact on how energy efficient your fridge or freezer must be in order to be sold um, in the EU market. Um, there is a lot of subsidies in place. These can be temporary and targeted at specific population groups or available during a specific period of time, such as the winter or the summer. Um, there are warm banks, which means basically public spaces where people can go and sit somewhere warm. Obviously, you need to be able to go there in order to enjoy this. Um, in the summertime, there has been um, public fountains and swimming pools, other areas that are artificially cooled for people to go and be able to um, have a more comfortable and healthier um, temperature. Um, information sharing campaigns, um, these are largely mechanisms by uh, public sector broadcasters in particular, but also local authorities, to tell people how they can cut their energy demand, how they can keep their homes at more comfortable uh, living temperature and so on. Smart meter rollout so that people can um, keep an eye on how much energy they are spending and therefore figure out what activities they might be undertaking that have a huge impact on their spending on energy. Um, various different energy price control mechanisms which are reflected in the maps that I was showing previously. So in certain EU countries, governments have taken a lot of control over um, energy price increases, offering subsidies for households, but also regulating how much utility companies can increase energy prices. Um, however, the only way to really address um, energy poverty um, in a structural manner resulting in long-term improvements, large-scale improvements, is by improving the energy efficiency of the building stock in Europe, which in some countries is way lower than we should have, much lower than it should have been 10 or 20 years ago. We had the technology to improve energy efficiency of our buildings 15 years ago when I started doing housing studies. Why is it still not done 
why do we still have energy efficiency improvement rates in the region of 1.2% roughly, rather than really going all out improving energy efficiency of our building stock, because that will be the only long-term mechanism that will reduce energy poverty rates now and in the future. Um, it will, over time, be cheaper for governments to really invest in energy efficiency improvements. And this is where energy poverty becomes um, linked to climate policy, because energy um, poverty and energy efficiency are two of the main issues that are covered in the um, energy efficiency directive and the energy performance of buildings directive, which are both part of the Fit for 55 package that Frank was talking about um, and really are key components to reducing energy consumption at the EU level and improving people's living comfort and therefore their health and well-being. But it's not easy, so I don't know how much time I have left. But um, there are an awful lot of challenges to addressing energy poverty. Um, the first one is a lack of shared definition. Um, I think the previous spe speaker mentioned that if we can't um, define it, uh, we can't describe it, we can't measure it, and therefore we can't address it. Um, we don't know exactly how many households we have living in energy poverty in Europe. We also don't really know how energy inefficient our building stocks are. So that's the first challenge that needs to be resolved in order for us to really move forward. Um, we do have some data on building stock quality, but this is not uniform. We have the energy performance in buildings um, certificate system, but it's not uniformly applied in various different EU countries. So EPC rating B or D can mean something very different uh, depending on which EU country you're in. Um, and from a personal experience, I can tell you that not every apartment in a given building is necessarily the same energy efficiency rating, um, even if your, um, the, the, the property details when you rent or buy somewhere would give you a certain rating. It's not always accurate. But the measures that countries, local authorities, European um, level policymakers have tried to put in place so far um, have been more or less successful really looking at specific um, measures in various different contexts. One of the challenges here is that something that might work in Germany, for example, does not necessarily work in France or in the UK, or um, something that works in Finland may not work in Italy because the challenges are very different, the, the building stock is very different, the tenure structure in countries is very different, um, and the regulation of the private rented sector might be very different. Um, in the UK, which I acknowledge is no longer an EU country. Um, let's not go into that. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad to say I still have an EU passport as well as a British one. Um, but it, in the UK, the building stock is known to be extremely leaky. It's responsible for about 30 to 40% of CO2 emissions, and we have had the technology to fix it for a very long time. Why have some of the recent attempts to really get people to improve the energy efficiency of their homes failed? Well, it's pretty straightforward. The only sector that you can actually regulate in the housing market is the social rented sector. And what has been happening in, in the UK since the Thatcher era is reduced share of social rented housing of the overall housing stock, increased share of private rented housing, which is notoriously difficult to regulate in countries where that sector is already uh, minimally regulated, less so in countries like Germany, um, where I do admire the private rented sector regulation on a regular basis. Um, but there has been various different programs um, there is a report that I'm happy to send you a link to where we looked at some of these, um, some of these um, programs in various different country contexts. But generally there are challenges around the allocation of resources. So whether you are actually allocating sufficient resources to the energy efficiency improvement program or um, 
whether you are targeting them in the right way. One of the challenges is that many of the energy efficiency funds require a co-payment. Right, so that's great. You can get a grant for about 50% of the cost, if you're lucky. But in order to do so, you need to be low-income household. How is this going to work out in practice? Most of the time, it doesn't. So countries might put on paper a lot of effort into improving energy efficiency of the building stock, but the take-up of these schemes is fairly low because you need to be low-income but still able to um, invest, let's say, 10 to 20,000 euros uh, in home improvements. Um, if you're a low income, you're highly likely to be living in a private rented home um, or in a social rented home. And you most likely don't have that 10 or 20,000 euros laying around in your bank account, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic. So allocation of resources and targeting. One of the challenges is also information sharing. Um, it's extremely difficult to figure out how best to improve the energy efficiency of your home. Whether you are allowed to do it, which goes into regulatory challenges, this is an issue particularly for people who live in apartments. How are you going to get it done? Who can you hire to do the work? Do you have sufficient number of sufficiently skilled workers? Do you have all kinds of cowboys who say, yeah, I can do that? but then two months later you end up with a lot of damp and black mould because it turns out that the person was not adequately qualified. This was a big issue in the UK. Um, there is actually a great example in the UK of the latest attempt by the government to improve energy efficiency on the large scale last winter. They put in place a six-month programme that households can apply to and they make pretty much every textbook mistake that you can make. Um, I, I strongly recommend you look it up. It's cited in the report called Context is Everything by Corporate Leaders Group Europe. Um, I should have really put a link to that report. But that is a very good example of how uh, these programs fail um, and how we need to do things better. But one of the greatest challenges, um, I mean, there are various different ones, split incentives, so landlords don't live in the home, so therefore they don't have an incentive to improve the energy efficiency of the house and um, tenants who live in the house have no say over how um, and what appliances you have um, whether you make mass massive large-scale renovations deep renovations or even just double glaze the windows um, timing and duration that was one of the examples in the, in the british um, recent failure um, not talking about brexit here um, Engagement with providers, also what the UK uh, government did wrong. They did not actually engage with the companies who would be delivering this service before they announced the fund. So the people who were interested in getting funding out of this program um, just didn't have anybody to deliver the work. They didn't have sufficient quantities uh, of skilled workers. They didn't have sufficient quantities of materials available in the market. So the waiting times were extremely long. Regulatory challenges I mentioned, particularly in relation to apartments. And then one of my favorite topics that Frank and I had a great debate last night in Brussels was about the incompatibility of some of the environmental and social objectives. So ETS2, for example, is often criticized because it would increase energy poverty rates. Um, However, there is the Social Climate Fund, which is intended to mitigate that potentially adverse impact. Um, however, it needs to be delivered in a way that actually benefits the lowest income households. The funding needs to be sufficiently high to um, actually enable the lowest income households to improve the energy efficiency of the properties they live in. Whether that money goes to their landlords in exchange of 10-year security, for example, um, those are questions that we need to tackle. Um, however, there is an awful lot in the European Green Deal uh, in the Fit for 55 package. Great targets for energy efficiency um, improvements. Um, very impressive objectives. Um, we just need to really figure out how to implement 
plans and the policies at the local and national level to really address this challenge. And I hope I didn't run terribly over time. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the next, if you can take one more <laughs> lecture, but then questions and answers quick, promise. But certainly, I mean, when you think about it, energy poverty is a question of, of transformation and transformation laying off. So the question now actually is directly going on, how do we do the transformation in the sector? What is working, what is not working? And that is what Sarah Mavis and her colleagues actually looked to in a study for the European car industry, actually first of this kind in terms of really analyzing what do we know about the transformation? Where are the gaps? But I shouldn't be speaking. The floor is yours, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Um, do you hear me? Okay. Um, so when we started to work on the just transition of the car industry, people kept asking us, why the car industry? Does the car industry need a just, just transition? And that's a relevant question, but I think um, it needs one, and in the next minutes I want to tell you why. Um, first, I will give you a bit of the context of a project um, where we developed um, these findings and the analysis, and then give a short spotlight on what's happening in the car industry, also in terms of emissions and <coughs> what are possible just transition pathways. And afterwards, I will present the four gaps of a just transition and ideas how to bridge them in the automotive sector. So concerning our project, oh, it's green. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of my slides change color as well. <laughs> it used to be we, white. We didn't, we didn't do it. We didn't touch it. <laughs> Computer, it's OK. Um, <laughs> it's a green deal, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you can read it, so it should be okay. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, it's a project we were working on since 2020, um, just transition in the European car industry. It's not just us, Nela, it's, I think we are seven partner organizations from Germany, Croatia, Slovakia, Czechia, Poland, and Hungary. And what was special about it that we had a um, great portion of um, Central and Eastern European perspective, and that's very underrepresented normally. The project is founded by the European, uh, by the German Fener Federal Ministry of Economic and Affairs and Climate Action through, Europe, through the European Climate Initiative, OIKI. Um, main outputs of the project were seven reports about the country's different country situations, as well as one European report and a synthesis report of all the reports we're going to launch next week. And multi-stakeholder dialogue formats, uh, workshops, but also conference in Brussels. The reports were based on desk research and stakeholder interviews of stakeholders from industry, civil society, politics, trade unions and NGOs. We asked them how do they perceive the just transition topic in the automotive industry. What I will be presenting is mainly um, the findings of the European report as we with Nela developed the European report. So, okay, that's not green anymore. <laughs> uh, about the current situation, um, I think there's so much to say um, but I think two factors make the automotive industry an important target for such a just transition policy. First and most important, it's just such an important industry in nearly all countries that we have seen it, in percentage of GDP, employment and exports, and also in overall Europe, it's around 6.1% of employment that it's linked to the, uh, is linked to the automotive industry. So it's just hugely important for European jobs at the moment. But at the same time, cars today um, account for a large proportion of CO2 emissions in Europe, around 15% of the current emissions seen from cars. And the whole transport sector, it's 20%. But there's another 
problem adding on to that. Um, because emissions should be falling as quickly as possible to reach zero emissions. And that's happening, I think Frank already mentioned it, that's happening in nearly all sectors, but it's just not happening in the transport sector at the moment. Emissions are still rising there. And I think that it, this has different reasons, but two main drivers I want to highlight is the trend towards ever larger and heavier vehicles and the growth of the overall European car fleet. So you have a rebound effect and all of the efficiency gains in car production get just outweighed by these effects. So you have rising emissions. So this situation makes it clear that the, the industry has to change, it has to transform in a way. Um, but the question is how should it transform? And that's the next question, the question of just transition pathways. And before jumping into the different pathways, I want to highlight something very special about the just transition in the automotive sector. Because traditionally, when we talk about just transition, we talk about the coal sector. And in the coal sector, just transition is a question of how do we phase out an industry? How do we phase out the coal industry? It's not gonna there's no coal industry afterwards, but the car industry is not phasing out. We're not phasing out the car industry. We're just transforming the car industry. So it's a completely different kind of just transition we're talking about. Um, and that's a big challenge because now we have to define how do we want to transform the car industry. Um, and we saw very good in our research that different countries and different stakeholder groups are working on different just transitions in the car industry. There's no general idea there to transform the car industry. So I think I want to highlight three um, pathways. The first and the most domi dominant one is the electrification pathway. Its general idea is to phase out the combustion engine and to substitute it by electric cars. So the stakeholders in favor of that are EU politicians, Western European countries, and also major OEMs, um, automotive manufacturers who have decided to move towards electrification. Um, what is the job perspective under this scenario? It depends very much on the battery industry, how much of the battery industry we can attract into Europe. So that's also very unclear. But the platform electromobility projects around 1.1 million new jobs that can be created in Europe due to the, in, within the shift to electromobility. So there should not be a big job loss in general. Um, the next one um, is mobility shift. What does mobility shift ma mean? A reduction of overall car transport and production and a shrinking automotive <coughs> industry and a substitution of the automotive industry by public transport. Stakeholders who are in favor of that are mostly environmental NGOs and civil society. Um, in this scenario, job perspectives are unclear, um, but outside the industry, if you look at the green transition in general, and we've seen in the last presentations, job perspectives are also positive within the overall transformation. Um, the third one, that's actually at the moment the most marginalized one, is technology openness. Technology openness is um, a pathway that wants to have, that is against a phase out of the combustion engine and wants to substitute fossil fuels by e-fuels um, and have e-fuels and electrification at the same time. The positive thing is that we can use all the infrastructure we're having at the moment, including the production capacities we're having. The negative thing is that e-fuels are not uh, efficient. So it's not energy efficient to produce e-fuels at the moment and we don't know if it will be in the future. And at the moment, it doesn't look like that. Stakeholders who are in favor of that are industry stakeholders, mainly suppliers. In our research, I don't know if it's um, always like this, and 
some Central and Eastern European countries. In this scenario, job perspectives are positive because there's not much um, that has to change in the industry. So, but European legislations at the moment point towards another direction, but this can change. So there's no final decision on which pathway um, is going to be pursued in the just transition of the automotive industry. That's very important to keep in mind. So now we come to the just transition path. Um, so if job perspectives are overall in each pathway positive, why do we need a just transition? And that's a very important point for me to make it clear that we still need a just transition. And um, because even if we assume that it's positive, this does not mean that it has a positive impact for all workers in the automotive industry. And what's, that's also a fairness question we were also discussing before. Um, and the problem is that the transformation has to be very fast during the next years. And it's actually incredible working in this field. So one month after you have some findings, they are outdated. So everything changed so fast um, at the moment. So that's a big challenge for region, industry, and workers who have to implement these changes. And that's why it needs a just transition. And in the course of our research, we identified four gaps of a just transition that need to be closed. The geographical gap, the skills gap, the timing gap, and the attractiveness gap. I will explain them shortly one by one. First, the geographical gap. Um, the geographical gap describes regional challenges that arise during the transition. Um, because it's not certain that the new jobs will appear in the same regions, the old ones will disappear. And every region is confronted with different e effects. That's particularly important if we also consider Central and Eastern European countries who often get overseen. So probably Germany has not such a big, not such big difficulties to do adapt than Central and Eastern European countries where much of the supplier industry and manufacturing um, of parts for the combustion engine is located. So what is ne would be needed are regional plans um, to address um, uh, these regional um, challenges. So the next gap is the skills gap. Um, it describes that um, for new jobs, different skills that might be required. And just transition policies need to enable smooth skill transformation. In the car European automotive industry, I think there are two um, approaches that need to get tackled. The first is um, foster reskilling within the industry, like also take um, companies um, in like companies have to develop internal reskilling programs, <coughs> particularly towards electrification and digitalization. But it's also necessary if we suppose that there will, will be a reduction of the industry in some parts that we um, implement regional reskilling programs into other areas um, like renewable energies, areas that are just rising. Um, so coming to the thir third gap, um, that's the timing gap. So also if people get reskilled, it's not guaranteed that there will be a smooth transition because maybe there's a timing gap. That means, means I get laid out in, in a job and I get reskilled into a new job, but maybe this new job does not arise just the moment um, that I get laid out. And so just transition policies need to ensure a smooth transition and implement social security schemes um, for workers who um, are in trouble because they don't find a new job. And here it's also, I want to highlight another point we found in our research that um, there must be implemented much more multi-stakeholder and social dialogues also on the regional and European level and in the interaction of these regional and European levels, because like particular regional challenges, mostly in, in the Central and Eastern European countries are overseen at the moment, and 
um, the timing gaps arising there. Least but not last, there's an attractiveness gap. The attractiveness gap means that maybe in the new jobs, um, the new jobs won't be as good as the old ones. And that's particularly important for the automotive context, since the automotive industry historically has benefited from above average wor uh, wages and working conditions. So just transition policies might must find a way how workers find attractive job opportunities in other sectors if they get reskilled to other sectors. And that also has to be taken into account. Um, so together, these four gaps constitute the main elements that just transition in the car industry has to focus upon. And concrete policies, how to bridge these gaps, depend a lot on the regional challenges and on the chosen transition <coughs> pathways of, pathway of the automotive industry. Um, okay, what was it? If you want to know more about the topic, you can download all the reports on our project website. And yeah, I hope I could give you a short insight into the complexity of the issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
technology, innovation and, and economic growth, while there is also a lot of thoughts um, in the scholars and everyone around actually the notion of economic growth and how that's actually sometimes not very coupling with true uh, sustainability and, and inequality reductions and poverty reduction. So yeah, my thoughts are, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So quick questions, quick answers. Sarah, I suppose we start with you. Uh, okay, I can start. Um, the rare miner minerals in the global <coughs> south, um, I think that's a very important question and we just didn't cover it in our research. Um, but I think the electrification of the industry brings with it the um, danger of externalizing costs into the global south. Um, and how much it does it is, has to be studied. <laughs> um, and also the um, thing about um, efficiency gains with the battery um, electric vehicle. There are also studies from China, I think, saying that the battery electric vehicle is not more efficient um, than a combustion engine. And it all depends on energy. So if our energy is green, the electric vehicle also is green. If it's not green, it's not green. Um, and at the moment, not all the European countries, for example, Poland, who has a big electric, uh, who has a big automotive industry, um, if they produce now electric vehicles, they won't be green because they don't have renewable energy. Um, but it's an important point to know that the emissions in the uh, in the car like concerning cars um, mostly happen after the production. And that's also why, for example, the automotive sector does not apply for um, support in the just European Just Transition Fund because just carbon intensive industry <coughs> can apply there. And it's not, ca not a carbon intensive industry. So I think that I, I don't have, I would like to show you a graph. So if you um, have the Quick production, answer. yeah, <laughs> it's so much uh, energy use, and then the use, it's so like the car use is so much energy use. So um, yeah, it's not, it's the consumption of the production. Okay, thank you very much. Next over to you, Fersa. With a plea for, for very quick answer, if you can. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so fundamentally the climate crisis is an inequality crisis. Most greenhouse gas emissions are generated by the wealth, wealthiest individuals, by the mega rich, and those most affected by the growing impacts of climate change are also the poorest and the least responsible for the crisis. So revising global taxation, particularly by taxing the richest among us, would accelerate both the fight against global warming and the fight against uh, po poverty. So in economic terms, it's the efficient way of handling this crisis. In practical terms, you need to get national states to agree to do that in a spirit of collaboration and coordination like it is suggested by SDG 17. So this is the optimal way uh, to tax. Whether we practically achieve it, it will take a lot of massaging between states and states and vested interests. And with regards to another general question, whether EU should protect and empower its own citizens or should care beyond that? Well, it should definitely care beyond that. I uh, see the non-vivid uh, discussion of the European Green Deal pre-launch with at least Africa 
and Middle East as a mistake. The climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the sustainability crisis is a global one. And unless we are really explicit in the synergies and the cost effects and have a really global view on handling the issue, we are not going to find the solution that we need. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Moving over to you, Sola. Um, yeah, I mean, there wasn't any specific questions on energy poverty, so I might just um, elaborate a bit on the critical raw materials uh, because that's another area that I'm working on. Um, and I actually did a student group presentation in Cambridge a couple of years ago, must have been pre-pandemic, uh, where we focused on the question of just transition and critical raw materials and what can and cannot be done about it by European um, actors. So one of the challenges is that the EU is a big market, is one of the largest markets in the world. So by regulating what kind of products and how they need to be certified as meeting certain conditions is certainly one way to go. So you can attach conditions, for example, against deforestation, um, which is currently being done by the European policymakers um, for palm oil and soy, which are used largely um, in the EU agriculture um, industry um, and food industry. But um, to do this for critical raw materials is something that is worth considering. Um, the other alternative way to uh, go on about it is to put requirements on companies. Uh, companies um, can lose or, well, not all press is good press, let's face it. And some companies have received a very bad press um, fairly recently for using critical raw materials that turns out have been dug by um, miners in certain developing countries, not naming any names here, in extremely unsafe conditions. Um, and that does not make the companies look good. And companies can actually take action here to ensure that their supply chains are socially sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. Thank you very much. Bang. Um, we started with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Many questions on the <coughs> critical raw materials, just to say. <coughs> also, the um, Green Deal industrial plan I mentioned, which was just adopted, includes as one of the measures uh, European Critical Raw Materials Act, which will be proposed soon to ensure the access to those raw materials and maybe also discuss um, access to those within the Union uh, where relevant. <coughs> and related to this, um, the, the social side of it, there's also a communication or initiatives to promote decent work worldwide, so uh, together with the ILO and others, so they, they have to be seen in conjunction, I guess. <coughs> that also relates to the other question on the um, global, uh, global perspective, yes, so just transition is not just an internal EU um, issue, it's a, ex as well an external issue, and we have to think just transition in, in both um, senses. You're right, we cannot have a just transition inside without promoting it also outside. There are a lot of initiatives, um, I may not be aware of all. <coughs> to mention Fit for 55, you have one initiative specifically, specifically with the so-called carbon border adjustment mechanism to avoid carbon leakage, to avoid that polluting industries go leave the union and promote from there and re-import to the union. Uh, gradually, the union will include um, in increase the tariffs, import tariffs on those goods to make sure that there's a level playing field. Um, and that ha was a key condition also for the ETS reforms. In trade policy, there's discussion on trade and sustainable development. So in trade agreements, partners normally have to um, commit to putting in place also environmental standards and social standards. Debatable how that's done, but I think uh, the efforts are being made to, to reinforce this. At COP, we have discussed at COP, um, the European Union obviously takes an offensive st stance on this and defends. Um, just transition issues and uh, equality issues, loss and damage was mentioned to be seen how the fund will be set up. But there are also more practically just transition declarations at COP. At Katowice was one on coal phase out, there was one in Glasgow on, on international financing to be followed up. And there are just transition partnerships being put in place, uh, for example, with South Africa and others to follow, Vietnam, Indonesia, many others. So the EU is trying to engage in, in those. And at European level, the neighborhood policy also have lots of activities. So um, 
For example, there are lots of uh, actions with the Western Balkans to promote just transition, coal regions and transition in those areas. And for the Repower EU initiative, to some extent, has been extended to apply to Ukraine. So the EU wants to, uh, has started reflections and putting up ideas on how we can help Ukraine once the war is op over, hopefully soon, or when it's over, to, to uh, let's say, repower that country and um, pro promote a fair energy transition also in that country. Um, and we already mentioned the, the taxonomy. So the EU also promotes uh, new fine standards in finance, global finance, which hopefully will help um, be, be uh, applicable at a global level. And maybe just to say <coughs> the narrative of the EU is even sometimes we hear we, are only, we only account for X percent of emissions worldwide or X percent, uh, or we, why should we move if others are not moving? I think that's not our approach. Our approach is this is the agenda to follow. It's the right thing to do probably the only competitiveness, growth, however you call it, social development strategy we have in Europe. And we just have to make sure that, it, uh, we, we, that we can also showcase to the world that it can work and can be beneficial and can be done in a fair way, which is also a contribution by Europe. On the question of well-being, a vast topic, just to say that um, there are reflections going on. So we, we, there are debates also on um, post-growth, the degrowth, well-being economy at European level. There's a big conference tomorrow in Brussels. Happy to invite you to follow. Um, but most, more specifically, the EU has in the environmental policy area the so-called environmental action program. The eighth one was just in place, and it has a concrete reference to uh, to moving to sus to a sustainable well-being economy by 2050, and asks the Commission to develop um, a set of indicators how to measure also what this well-being economy is. So these are things concretely we work on with colleagues, notably in, in the Director General for Environment and the Joint Research Center. And we have discussions on the donut economy or others, so open to have that. Um, probably in the end, it boils down to a question, how do we measure growth and what is growth? How do we define green jobs, uh, new products and services, local economy? So probably it's a question of measurement as, w as much as of orientation, uh, in which direction we grow. And my last comment, I want to come back to, to Fieber's comment on that we are lagging behind on environment, uh, environmental files in particular. Um, don't want to judge here, but could be true because uh, not all initiatives under the European Green Deal have been proposed already or implemented. And in particular, the, those initiatives um, focusing on the environmental policy side and transport poverty to some extent are still coming. So there will be packages coming in the new next month, the one on consumer green claims and consumers in March, one on soil health in June, and there are other initiatives in the pipeline, notably a reform of the electricity market design in Europe, because currently electricity prices depend on gas, the highest prices, why should they? Probably that's something which will be reformed. And there will also be, last sentence, a new climate target set at European level for 2040, works are going on how to do that and um, so to design transition pathways and this will have to be included in the European climate law to make all three targets 20, 30, 40 and climate neutrality 50 legally binding. Thank you very much. If I may very quickly, it, it yeah. is true that when you assess the policies, even those that have already been announced, then the European Green Deal seems very strong with regards to sustainable use of the environment and the ecosystems. But when you measure performance, mm -hmm. then the performance on these um, uh, SDGs that are relevant to environment and ecosystem is lower compared to other SDGs as implemented in Europe. So I, am, uh, I agree with you. I, it, the European Green Deal needs more time to be implemented, uh, implemented and endorsed. And I do think that it is the leadership example of sustainable transition across the world. I think we, I think we almost take that as a closing word. But first, as a, as a chair, wrapping up, um, not even trying. I mean, pretty much this conference here was designed to, to act as a sort of agent provocateur to get you the insights of what is around with a just transition. And we've heard many challenges, we've heard some solutions, but certainly I think what we can take away from, from that evening here is that we have to deep digger. 
deep, well, dive deeper um, into into looking into into the element here, yeah? and, and that's why we actually intend to have a follow-up conference on, on financing just transition, looking more into the well individual aspects of that, and that was a starting point in in terms of well provoking your thoughts, provoke, challenging you actually because you'll be the one living that. So with that, um, hopefully good discussions afterwards. Have a good evening and thank you very much for bearing with us. Have a good evening and thanks a lot.